Okay, so one of the questions that I was asked um, in the chat in the online class, because remember I use these videos for both the face-to-face -face in case you don't need to refresh or you miss class, but then I also use the same videos for the online classes as well. And so I am gonna address one of the questions that I received from the online questions. And it was, what happens if I do not do well, or even if I fail, all of the 314 tests, okay? So before I explain that, I need you to understand that we are doing two classes, right? And so you have the 0314, which is the developmental part of the two courses. And then you have the 1414, which is the actual college level portion of the two classes, right? And in this one, you had um, unit A, which we already did, right? Um, unit B and then C and D. And then over here you have units one, two, three, four, and five. And so that's what uh, makes up those nine unit tests that are mentioned inside the syllabus, okay? This one, a lot of people did not do too well because of different situations, okay? Either you were still trying to get the hang of how to work on and navigate online or, um, you didn't get around to doing the homework on time. And so you really had no idea what was going on. Or you were one of the ones that was like checking all the answer choices instead of actually factoring, right? Um, so there were different reasons why the test A didn't go so well. However, what I am allowed to do is replace, and I can only do it once. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace your unit one grade um, the unit A, I'm going to replace it with how, whatever you do on your unit one college algebra, okay? So if you did not do so well on this one, that one test I will replace with whatever you get on unit one. Now, there are only two sections that are being tested in unit one. So it, hopefully you'll have some time to practice with them before you have to have that unit one test, okay? Um, if for some reason you don't do well on any of them, Okay, any of these A, B, C, or D tests, you just completely fail this developmental part altogether. That doesn't mean that you actually get an F in that class, okay? Because the college algebra stuff can override the developmental stuff. If you're passing the college algebra stuff, that's all you really care about, okay? The developmental stuff is just to teach you the topics and the skills that you'll need to do the college algebra stuff, okay? Um, so all those skills like completing the square and factoring, the, the main junk that we've been learning these last two units, all of that is in preparation for this first unit, okay? So when we get in there, we're gonna have to talk about circles and in circles, you have to complete the square twice for just one problem, okay? So that's what I'm saying. Like all of this is just to kind of beef you up and get you ready for the college. So there's nothing that prevents me from doing replacements in that direction, okay? Or college algebra replaces your developmental. Okay, so if for some reason you don't do well, or maybe you just don't have a great average of your developmental scores, that's okay, because they can get replaced with their college algebra stuff, okay? So in the way it'll work is I'm not going to switch individual scores after this first one. This first one is the only one that I do that to, because like I said, there were a lot of like getting used to the technology. Some of us were having to take that test for you guys specifically, you were having to take that test in an environment that you didn't sign up for right? So that it, it affected things. <laughs> okay, so um, that's the one that I'm going to replace. All the other ones I won't replace. Whatever you score and however you do, that's what's going to go in the books. But at the end of the semester, if your college algebra average is higher than your developmental average, I will just go put that number in there and that's the grade you get. Does that make sense? Okay, it's to benefit you. Nothing I ever do is going to make somebody's grade go down. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay, anything that I do will only be to benefit everyone, okay? Okay, um, so that was one question that I had. Does anybody have any other questions? Like, how is the test gonna work? What are we doing from here? Were there specific problems on the review that you wanted me to cover? Anything like that, now is your chance to ask all those questions. And then just FYI, we are doing, because we're face-to-face, -face, so 
If I get no questions, we can start the test immediately, but I wanna give you guys plenty of time to ask questions before we go jump into that, okay? But we are doing the test in class today. So I saw someone actually in the, um, I'm gonna pull it up just so y'all can all see the review. It might not have the exact same numbers that you have, but it has the same problems for everybody. So it's just the numbers are different for each person. Um, yeah, that's right. Oh, I've never typed in a password in here before. Oh. I don't remember my password. Settings, password, and search for the yeah, other. No. Oh, that's not password. No, no, that's not. Okay, we are in web assign. So I'm gonna go to the unit B review. And someone asked about how to convert from like radical form to um, exponent form or even vice versa, right? So I think there were a few problems in here that did have us switch those forms. Dun, dun, dun is it there it is these two here and then this one here so 10 11 and 12 Does anybody um, not want me to go over those <laughs> i can go over all three so for 10 on their review they want um rational exponent form And then I'm going to come down here and write number 11. And this is the same thing. They want rational exponent form. And then down here, we'll do 12. And they give you this. And I know you see the answers there because it pops up for me, but I'm going to explain how that happens radical form. Okay. Oh, let's go to the paper. Okay, here we go. So for number 10, it has the cube root of 125 and it's asking me for rational exponent form, which means I basically need to have a base and then an exponent and the exponent, I'm guessing, is going to be a fraction because that's what rational means, okay, in these fractions. So the first thing you want to do is use your rule that says um, if you have this, that that can be written as a to the 1 over that index, right? And why 1? Because the exponent in here is a 1, right? So that's going to be the first thing that I do. 
You could do something else first, but that's just the first thing I'm going to do, okay? So in here, what it does is it becomes 125 raised to the one third power. However, that's not the final answer, okay? Because 125 can be written as a base to the power, right? 125 is actually five times five times five. And what's an exponent way that I can write five times five times five? It would be five to what power? The third power, okay? And then you have this one here. What do they have as the final answer? Because I'm curious now. I won't give you that problem. Oh, they don't. They just leave it as 125 over three. I want to see if they would have accepted that as my answer. Dun, dun, dun. What number was it? No, I don't think they liked it. Yep, they did not like it. It is because it's not asking you to simplify it. So I won't give you numbers, just FYI. I'm going to give you letters because I know you can't simplify the letters, right? <laughs> so you won't do things that you naturally want to do. Like I just naturally wanted to read this thing, right? And simplify it. Um, so I will give you letters just to avoid that from happening. Because normally what you would write is you would then multiply these together. And what is three times one third? It's three over three or just one, right? So this becomes five to the power one, which is just five. But that's not what they're asking you to do. Like he said, they're not, Kenneth said, they're not asking you to simplify that. They're just asking you to put it in its rational exponent form, okay? So then I should have stopped as soon as I put it in a rational exponent form, right? That is a rational exponent. Now, the second one is more like what you would see on the test because it doesn't have numbers. And so then you won't be able, you'll less be able to simplify this than you can with the numbers. Okay. But for this one, you do have to apply this same rule here. So you do have to turn a radical into a rational exponent. So I do have to take this term here and write it as x to some power. Does anybody want to guess or know what that power is? Uh -huh, it is one half, right? Because the exponent in here is one. And what kind of radical is this? A square root. So then that's the denominator is the square. But in the, in the computer, remember, it only wants one base and one exponent, right? So I have to put these together so that I just have x and then a single exponent, okay? So what rule am I going to be using if I'm trying to do that? There was a rule that said if you had these two things multiplied, as long as the bases were the same, the base stays the same, but you're supposed to be adding those exponents together, right? When you take x times x squared, you get x cubed, right? Because you added those exponents together. So it's the same thing here. I'm going to have to do 8 plus 1 half. And that we can do in the calculator if you don't know how to do it. Um, what is in my calculator? Um, if you don't know how to do it on paper or in your head, you can use the calculator. And so I get 7 over 2. And this is one base with one rational exponent, right? So just make sure you convert your radical part over using that rule. And to be more general, any exponent that's down here will go in your numerator, okay? So any exponent that's inside there will become your numerator. And whatever the index is, even if it's an invisible two, will become your denominator. This is the big rule to remember. Okay. Um, you're going to write some of those rules on the board when you do your um, test because you guys are going to do your tests on paper. Um, and the reason is is because there were issues with people logging into the laptops yesterday, and I wasn't sure if that was going to get fixed today in time. So I went ahead and printed them just in case they weren't working. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so then that particular problem. Now this one was tricky because I had a lot of people doing weird stuff with that one. Um, the first thing that you need to realize is that you need to be able to identify what the base is here, okay? So what does this negative four sevenths, what does it actually apply to? That's the exponent of who? Is that the exponent of x? Is that the exponent of two? Or is that the exponent of two x? Okay, you have to be able to identify that. Now, I'll let you know that if the two is not in parentheses, okay, if it is in parentheses, it's part of the base, meaning that my answer over here would have a 2x in it, and I'd have to figure out what the exponent is, okay, or whatever it is. But here, the two is not in parentheses, so the two is not part of my base. Instead, it acts more like a coefficient. So in your brain, you should be visualizing this. This is like two times this guy. And then it's evident that that exponent is only applying to the x if you see it like this in your brain, right? Again, if it were in parentheses, then the two x would be the whole base. And that whole thing would have to go inside the house, okay? But because it's not in parentheses, when I go to write a house, only the x is going to be in the house, okay? Now I do have a problem here though. I see that it has the seven in the denominator. So I know that my base or my index will be seven, right? But it has a negative four in the numerator, which means this would be a negative four. But in the radical form, they don't like you to any form. They never like you to keep your exponents negative. So you have to remember what a negative exponent means and that is this rule, that it actually means it should exist in the denominator. And when it does, you don't have to put the negative anymore, okay? So what that means is that you have this two sitting out here on the side, but you're actually gonna have the seventh root of one over x to the fourth. Okay. And that can be simplified. You can use one of those other rules that says you can split this fraction. And so the seven through any root of um, one is one. And the bottom just stays like that, unfortunately. And then you can multiply those out and end up with two in the numerator. And then the seventh root of x to the fourth in the denominator. I'm gonna show you another way to do that because there is another way. Remember I told you, there's, it's all about your choices. As long as you're following the rules, it doesn't matter what order you do them in because this is not order of operations. You're just applying exponent rules, okay? So notice that the rule I applied first was this one up here in the box, right? I applied that rule first to get the radical. Then I applied another rule where it said I can distribute this radical to both the numerator and denominator. And then of course, I finally just multiplied it out. But I can do it backwards. Instead of applying the negative exponent rule after applying the radical rule, I could do them the other way around. I could have gotten rid of the negative exponent first and then applied the radical rule. So let me show you what that would have looked like. So number 12, again, is 2x to the negative 4 sevenths. So I got quite a few complaints in my, <laughs> in this first test. And one of them was that, that they were docked so many points because they didn't do it the way I did it. I do have to do the test myself, right? That's how I figure out how much time to give you guys. I take it myself and however long it takes me to take the test, I multiply that by three or more if I feel like it's necessary. Um, and so a lot of these tests will take me like four or five minutes to do, but I give you 60 minutes because that I feel like that's a reasonable amount of time. Okay. Um, but I'm not going to sit there and do every single problem five ways, right? On my solutions. I'm just going to do it the one way that comes to me while I'm taking it and then go to the next problem and do that problem the one way that comes to me. And then do that. And usually I try to stay consistent with whatever I've been showing you guys in class. Okay. Um, I'm not going to show all the different ways that you could possibly do number one. Okay. 
But that doesn't mean that if you don't do number one, the exact way that I put in the solutions that you won't get any credit. Because I know very well that there are multiple ways to go about a problem and still come up with the same correct answer, okay? So this is a perfect example of that situation. Like I did it one way and I got the correct answer, but you could have done it a different way and still end up with the same answer. First thing though, is, is the two the base? It is not in parentheses, so it is not the base. So visualize the problem separately, okay? If you don't want to visualize it separately, then actually write it separately, okay? Um, then you're going to apply that negative exponent rule first. So then this becomes one over x to the four seven, right? Then I apply that power rule that tells me to change it to a radical. And then it becomes the seventh index with x to the four power inside. And then if I put this like a fraction, top times top, bottom times bottom, and you get the exact same answer, okay? So it doesn't matter which way you went, as long as you're applying both of those rules, then you'll get there. Which order of the rules you apply does not matter, okay? You should still get there. Okay. Let me go back to that review. Hopefully I've had some time to go look at it and maybe have a question now. But that's not what they want. They do not want us to simplify that. Does anybody have any other ones you want to go over? We did not really cover quadratic formula. So there's not going to be a problem on this test with quadratic formula. It'll be on the next test. I should have removed these from the review, and I should have removed them from the 1.5 homework. I can still go in there and do it. So if you did those problems, it just won't count. <laughs> if you haven't done those problems, your grade will probably improve because they're going to be gone. Okay, But those completing the uh, quadratic formula, we have not covered. Okay, anybody have any other, you wanna see another one worked out? Or just a question in general, like how is this gonna occur? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me, whenever there's a negative exponent. So this should have given me a new version. Yep, there it is. So five, five X to the negative two thirds. I also wanna talk about this. Now in all honesty, I'm gonna do both of them and you'll see that they're two totally different answers. Um, To me, even though my brain went in one direction the first time I did number 12, honestly, I like this method better. Um, it just looks a little less crowded than the other method, okay? So I would get rid of your negative exponent just as a, you know, advice. Get rid of your negative exponent first and then convert it over into its radical form, okay? So the two rules that I have to use are this rule that allows me to get rid of that negative exponent, right? Putting it in the denominator. But when you do, it turns positive, exactly. And then this one, which turns it into this expression. And if you do them in that order, to me, it looks a little bit less busy in all your paperwork, okay? So, but even though I'm gonna apply these rules in this order, the answers are gonna be different for these two things. Because here, it's not in parentheses, which means these are separated. And that exponent only applies to the X and that's it, okay? Whereas this one is in parentheses, so the whole thing has that exponent, okay? So when I do stuff, with it, I need to do it to the whole 5x, okay? So for this one, it's a lot like the one we just did. First thing I'm gonna do is take care of that negative exponent. 
This is the only guy with the negative exponent, so you should not be doing anything with that five, okay? So when I make it go away, it's gonna become positive, but now it's downstairs, okay? And then next, I'm gonna apply this rule, but it's downstairs, so my little radical thing is gonna be downstairs. And the denominator is my index, and the numerator is my exponent. And then the last thing you can do is kind of make this turn into a fraction by putting it over one and then doing top times top and bottom times bottom. Multiplying by one doesn't change anything, right? So you just end up with this one fraction, okay? That's different from the other one. The other one, when I have to take care of this negative exponent, the whole thing goes downstairs and becomes positive, okay? So see the difference? The whole thing had to go down. Then when I go and apply that power rule, the whole thing has to stay with the power two, okay? You can square that if you wanted to so that you don't have the parentheses, but then notice it becomes 25. Both of these are perfectly okay. Your test does have choices, so find the one that matches in the choices, right? So if you don't see this, then look for that. But I guarantee you this is wrong. This one down here is wrong, right? Because here the square only applies to the x. It doesn't apply to the five, right? So this one is the bad one. Good. Any other ones? So what is this test? This test is not too many concepts. We did all of the radicals, right? You break them up into their little primes and then you pull out what you can pull out. Um, the only ones you have to be careful with are the ones that say you can't use the calculator because those you do have to do the primes. Like eight is two times two times two and then how many twos can I take out, right? Um, if it doesn't say anything about without a calculator, then use your calculator, right? Square root of eight is two square root of two, right? As long as it doesn't say don't use a calculator, you can use it. Um, sure. Sure. I think almost at the very end. I don't want to go. 21? This one here. Okay, good. Good, good, good. 21. Let me write it down and then I'll go over. So what does your brain want to do with that problem? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Does that, does anybody know that word? Complex what? Conjugate, there you go. So yes, so you multiply by this really weird looking one, right? Okay. But because I'm gonna have two terms times two terms at the top, and I'm gonna have two terms times two terms at the bottom, you have to do the foiling, okay, or the distributing. So what you do is you take this four and you distribute them in the top. You take this four and you distribute them at the bottom. Eventually I'll go to the I's next, okay? But for the four, I'm gonna get 16 and positive four I. At the bottom, I'm going to get 16 and positive 4i as well. But now I've got to distribute this positive i, and down here, I have to distribute this negative i. So I'm going to do my little arrows in a different color so you can see what I'm doing there. So positive i times 4 is positive 4i. Positive i times positive i 
is positive i squared, right? And then now at the bottom, this one is negative i times a positive four, so we get negative four i. And then negative i times a positive i is what? Negative i squared. And before you continue, you can do two steps in one here. You can replace those i's squared with negative ones, and you can also combine your regular i's together, okay? So I'm gonna have 16, and then these i's I'm gonna combine together. They're both positive though. So that means I have eight i's now. And that i squared is going to become a negative one. Then at the bottom, I'm going to combine these guys. But what happens to those? Mm -hmm. So I have no more i's, and then I have minus a negative one. So then here I have 16 plus 8i, and with the double sign, what's the true sign with those double signs on the top? Should it be a plus one or a minus one? Right. You just multiply those signs, right? A positive times a negative. That means the true sign should be a negative or a minus in there. What about at the bottom? Should it be a minus or a plus? Right. Negative and a negative makes it plus one. And then the last thing is just to combine those real numbers. So on the top, I'm gonna have 15 plus 8i, and at the bottom, I'm gonna have 17. And then they don't like it like that, right? They like it, the real number in the front, another real number, and then an i on the side. Okay, that's how they want the answer always. So I can do that by splitting this fraction into 15 over seven plus eight or 15 over, 17 plus eight over 17, and then the I on the side. And so you just put each one over the 17. Mm -hmm. You can put it, eventually it needs to go on the side, but if you did that where you just like, oh, well I split each one over there, that's fine. But yes, they do like the I on the side. They like it like that. And these are equivalent, right? If I take this and I'm trying to multiply by i, you could put this guy over one and then you get eight i over 17, right? So they're equivalent. I don't ever do this step. I just put it on the side. I don't know, because when you look on the choices, it'll be on the side, right? <laughs> That's why I put the choices there. One, to make sure that you're doing the problem within the test times, because you had to have selected something, right? That confirms that problem's been done. Um, but then two, it also kind of gives you a hint on what the answer should look like. Because a lot of the issue with um, algebra is that you can go and go and go and go and go and just keep going. <laughs> and then you don't know where to stop. And that's why we have like these formalities, like we like the answers to look like this, or we like the answers to look like that, so that you have an idea of where to stop. But sometimes people just go in a loop. They change it to one form, and then all of a sudden they're going back to the other form again, and it's not good. <laughs> so the choices help you and see what the answers should look like. Okay? Does anybody have any other questions? I need to make sure that my notifications are off because I do not want my phone beeping or doing anything weird while y'all are trying to test. Okay, any other ones you wanna see? Is everybody okay with completing the square? I need you to know how to do that. <laughs> Not only will you get a problem wrong on this test, but you'll get like half the problems wrong on the next test. Okay, so I need you to know how to complete the square. Um, there was some up here, right here, complete the square. Um, this one's the easy one. This one's the harder one. Okay, whenever it has that number in front of the X squared, that's the harder one but you need to know how to do both because we don't know when we get the circles if there's going to be a number in front of that x squared or no number in front of that x squared. Yeah, I'm going to go over both. 
Okay. I'm going to need another page because those are not, I mean, they're fun, but <laughs> they're a lot of work. And so this tidbit, I won't put on the test. You really, on the board or anything, you really will have to know it, okay? So you do need to know what it is you're supposed to be adding to both sides of the equation to do that process, complete the square. And what are we adding to both sides? We're doing that B over two squared to both sides, right? That you have to know. When I'm completing the square, this thing is what I should be adding to both sides. Okay, but before you can do that, you got to get the terms with the X's by themselves. Okay, so first step is to minus the six over. So that that six is gone and now I have a negative six on the right hand side. And as long as there's no number here, I can just go straight into adding what I need to add on both sides, okay? Now, A is the number in front of X squared. B is the number in front of X. So in my case, it's a positive six, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take these two terms and I'm gonna add a positive six over two squared. And I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. I'm gonna add a positive six over two squared. Now, I had a lot of people get confused about the next step. Um, and you can do the next step in two ways. First thing I like to do is I like to simplify that big parenthesis thing. So what do you get here at the very end when I've done all this computation? Mm -hmm. Six divided by two is three, right? And then three squared is nine. So really, you're just adding nine to both sides. Now the left-hand side is there's two ways to do it, okay? Either you factor it, like however you're used to factoring, or you use that shortcut that I told you guys about, okay? And the shortcut is, is you put X, and then whatever you had in the parentheses before you squared it goes in there with it. So I had a positive six over two. What do you get when you do six over two? But it'd be positive, right? So then you put positive three in here with the square. That's the shortcut to use whatever's inside here, right here. If it were negative inside there, I would put minus three down there in my parentheses, okay? That's the shortcut. If you don't memorize a shortcut, you don't remember it correctly every single time and you're getting that part wrong, um, what you can do is actually just factor it. You can show me your steps on the side on how you're factoring. I've seen some people doing things like all kinds of weird things. Y'all have factor all kinds of, it just depends on who taught you how to factor <laughs> the first time you learned it. Um, but there are all kinds of different methods that everyone's doing. I saw one that had like an X squared and a nine. And then they were trying to like figure out factors of this guy would be an X and an X, factors of that guy, three and three. And as long as this gave me six, then they, I mean, I've seen all kinds of things. <laughs> um, then there's the AC method, which is the one that I taught you. There's also guess and check. And there's nothing wrong with guessing and checking, but make sure that you're telling me I'm guessing and checking. Um, so you can just say guess and check. And then how do you come up with your factors? You could say something like this is three times three. So that's why I'm guessing three and three. And if you multiply this out by the checking part, you'll notice you do get that answer, right? And so you know that this is how you factor it, right? You're telling me how, where this came from by showing me those numbers there. You don't even have to do this, although this is showing your work as well or something like that. I'm telling you, y'all did all kinds of weird things and I did not dock because of it. Are those for me? Are they calculators? Does anybody not have a calculator? You don't? Okay. Everybody else has one? Do you have that, um, the CI36 Pro, the rest of you? Yes? Okay. Thank you. 
use a shortcut, doesn't matter, but you got to get here. That's the goal, right? Once you're there, then you're using that extracting the roots idea, right? So if I want the square to go away, it can, but I'm going to get plus or minus the square root of whatever's on this side. And I have a three on that side. And that's the extracting roots part. I don't have, it could be anything. There could be anything in this parentheses. But in order for that square to go away, you're going to get plus or minus the square root of whatever number was on that side, okay? That's also something you'll have to know. It's not gonna be given to you in a note sheet. In order for you to get rid of a square, you have to take the square root. And when you do that, you always get plus or minus, okay? That's different then when they give you the problem with the square root, that's what they gave you. You do not put plus or minus. The answer is just three. This is positive, this is positive. If they give you the root, you keep it at whatever sign it is. If there was no radicals here whatsoever and you go and put one in, that's when you have to have the plus or minus, okay? So that's a big, big misconception I get. You want to put plus or minus on all the square roots and so it doesn't work like that, okay? Okay, so from there, all I do is minus this three over, but I can't combine stuff inside of a house with stuff that's outside of a house. They just don't go together. So I do have X all by itself, but then they like the regular number in the front and then the radical number in the back. That's the same reason why they like the eyes in the back, because eyes are radicals, right? They're square roots of negative one. So you always want the radicals on the right-hand side. And you'll see in the choices too, they always have the radicals in the right-hand side. Your calculator though, for some reason, does not like radicals in the right-hand side. So it always puts them backwards on your calculator. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, that was the easy one. So before we go any further, I definitely want to do the one that was a little bit harder. And that was the one that had the number in the front. I think it was a three, yeah. Three X squared minus five. And whenever you have that number in front, unfortunately, it usually means you're gonna end up with fractions, which is not, you know, ideal, but it's not the end of the world either. And you have a calculator to help you with fractions, okay? So first step is always the case. You have to get the X squared and the X's by themselves. So I'm gonna have to add over this five. That should always be your first step. You need to manipulate that equation so that both of the X terms are on one side and then your constant is on the other side. It has to look like this for you to begin. Okay, X squared, X is, and then the number on the other side. But I do have a number in front on this one, don't I? Which is not great. But how do you get rid of it? You divide everybody by that number. Everybody across the board. So three, three, and three. Then that will make it go away. But unfortunately, it means now I have fractions. but it's not gonna change the process. I'm still going to add that B over two squared. It's just that the B part is a fraction, okay? So I'm gonna add something over two squared to both sides. What is the B in this case? Mm -hmm, it's negative and it's a fraction, right? And the whole fraction business is why I use the shortcut because I really don't like to sit there and try to factor out a trinomial that has fractions in it. <laughs> it's not fun. Um, but that's why I use the shortcut. It's specifically for fractions. Okay, so let's see. I'm gonna do, I just wanna know what's in the parentheses because for me to use that shortcut, I just need to know what's in the parentheses, right? So I'm gonna do that first. So I'm gonna hit a fraction and I'm gonna type negative two over three. So notice my numerator is a fraction. Notice that the main fraction bar is like wider than the little fraction of the third, right? And then at the bottom I have two. So I'm gonna hit enter and it simplifies for me, it's negative one third. So this is, Oops, I changed that for some reason. So this is actually negative one third that's being squared here. So now again, I use the shortcut for this side. For that side, I cannot. I have to actually square that and figure out what number it is and then add it together. But over here, I'm gonna say X and a square and what's inside this parentheses before I square it. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what's gonna go in here. It's gonna go negative or minus one over three. I did use a shortcut. On this side though, I do have to actually square it. And in my calculator, I can just do parentheses, negative one over three, close the parentheses and square it. So that this looks exactly like what's on my calculator. Right? I know I didn't type it in wrong. And I get one ninth. And then I can do five thirds plus one ninth. And it tells me that it's 16 over nine. Now I have to flip over, but I'm going to apply that root, right? So when I apply the square root, the square will go away and I'll just have this stuff by itself. So I'll end up with X minus one third by itself, but 
but then plus or minus the square root of the other side. That's the extracting roots part of it, right? Now I can simplify that though. And remember what we mentioned in the last class, as long as there's no exponent and no coefficient here to distribute or to multiply out, you don't need those parentheses. And over here, I can actually take the square root of 16, which is four, and the square root of nine, which is three. But I do still have to solve for x. So I do still have to add the one third. Now here, I don't have any radicals. So it really doesn't matter how I write this. I can put the plus or minus in the front if I wanted to. And the one third in the back. But because there's no radicals still, then they are going to expect me to simplify this. Okay, there's no radicals whatsoever. So essentially, I'm going to have two answers. I'm going to have positive four thirds plus one third, and then I'm going to have negative four thirds plus one third. And if you type those in your calculator, I always type fractions in my calculator because my brain does weird things and I don't want to get the wrong answer. Negative four over three plus one over three. Oh, see that one simplified down to negative one. And so these are the choices you'll see. You won't see them look like this when there's no more radicals. If there were radicals, it does stay looking like that, doesn't it? And that last problem we had, it did stay like, looking weird like that. Okay, it's about that time. Let me go ahead and stop recording this. Um...